Hi everyone. So today we have our first Stephanie Hirsch from the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. A little about her background. She earned her uh, doctoral degree in chemistry from Australian National University. And since then, it has been serving in the academia. Her research interests include uh, design and synthesis of unique inorganic and organic metallic complexes, with a particular focus on fun functional transition level systems, multi metallic systems containing platinum and palladium with applications in energy transfer and catalysis. So, today she is going to talk to us about specific class of organic metallic complexes and how such materials have been used to quantify the effect of uh, structural modifications uh, that have um, nonlinear optical responses. So please join me in giving her a warm welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is so great. I'm super excited to be here. I was invited uh, back in uh, last year, and then the plan was to do it, I think, in the, was it February or something like that? And then it snowed, and then we rescheduled it, and it snowed again, and it was rescheduled it, and then, it's, and then after the third time, we just sort of like gave up sort of thing. So I'm really excited. This is a great crowd to have here. Um, <laughs> do keep in mind that if I say something that's appalling really long, you're more than welcome to pull me up. They're like, that was making your sense. Just a heads up on that one there. Um, just to do a bit of promotion, uh, if you need stuff made, if you want someone who does synthesis, Come and talk to us. We might be able to help you out with that. Uh, we've done some work with Ken Wade making moths for her, or many of you might know her. Uh, we did some stuff here making these uh, systems that contain uh, arsenic. So we like making stuff. So if you need something like maybe you've got an idea, come and talk to us. You know, we're down in the basement, but most of the time we're pretty happy in this when it comes to this sort of thing. So there's my promotion there. Um, Quick background, I'm going to keep my background fairly short, except to sort of where it illuminates this talk. This talk is on some material from some time ago. Um, I'm going to give you a very, very brief background to nonlinear optics. I was super excited because there was this light matter class, and I was just like, yeah, hey, Ryan's going to teach you all that sort of stuff. That changed angles a little bit, but I hope it will still be somewhat informative particularly for the people who are not coming from the synthesis angle, but who are coming from the physics perspective, you know, which is very different from how a chemist approaches things. You know, it's heading in the same direction, but coming from opposite ends of the spectrum. Maybe we won't get to this last material. I think I'll switch back to my green laser point of the purple doesn't show up too well. Um, you know, we might not get all the way through to the end. So just a heads up on that. I've got my timer here, so we all get out with a reasonable amount of time. Sweet. Um, I come from a little spot here on the map, country New South Wales. It's weird to think growing up chasing cows uh, that you end up as a professor one day. It just makes absolutely no damn sense whatsoever. But here we are, right? You know, one of these weird things. Um, I, as mentioned, I did my doctorate in Australia, Australian National University, prestigious research-based institution. I postdoc at University of Florida, uh, sorry, University of Miami, and then ended up in Montana, which was great, you know. Uh, and then I ended up at NAU. Uh, the Department of Course Chemistry Biochemistry has focused on masters and undergraduates, but I'm very, very lucky to be able to be uh, working with APMS, having graduate students and other people that I get to interact with this thing, right? Having mirror students as well, having NASA space grant people like uh, Henry here in the front of the audience. So always looking for new collaborations and a chance to do fun stuff. So let's get into the meat of the talk. We've got some students here. Some of them did some of this work, some of them did other stuff, but that's the overall idea, okay? Student driven. Here is where I start to go off the rails because <laughs> this is stuff which is non-linear optics. What does that mean? Normally, what we mean by that, and unfortunately, is there any way to move that thing? Or... Oh, cheers, maybe. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Ah, lovely. Thank you so much. All right. Let me just back up since I think that has now biffed my slide advancer. There we go. We've got this nice linear equation here. We've got some polarizability represented here by alpha, and we've got a linear relationship. The change point between A and it changes proportionally some point B. That's a linear relationship. That's linear optics. Now we've got this relationship here. Again, you know, we've got this E local electric field, and then we've got this chap. Anyone know who this chap is? Yeah, 
Yeah, it's Raman, okay? Uh, from the 1930s, famous, of course, for Raman spectroscopy, the Raman effect. Of course, you might wonder, we really only start to investigate Raman effects when we get high-intensity light sources, specifically things like lasers. When was the laser invented? Trivia question. Yeah, 69. So lasers came first, then lasers. Okay. How did we discover this effect? Well, it's really, really cool. Okay. And here we go. They took a telescope, turned the telescope around, pointed it at the sun, and then you have this incredibly highly focused, highly intense, I love they call it here, sunlight pencil of very great intensity. Okay. It's only once you get intense light sources that you start to see non-linear effects. Okay. Linear effects we observe every day. You change the refractive index of the media, and you change how much light bends when it moves through it. Light moves differently in diamond, and it looks very different than what it does in water or mineral oil or a variety of other materials. So we've got our Raman chap here. We're going to move forward a little bit. And again, ah, oh, come on. Okay. This is where we start looking at, hopefully I don't have to manually advance, but bear with me if this uh, slide advance, it gives me some trouble. We start to look at this one here. So this turns out to be a Taylor series. And I see Ryan nodding over here. As long as he's nodding, I'm in good spot. <laughs> when he starts doing this, I know I'm like switched to the synthesis part. Okay. <laughs> the thing is, this is a Taylor expansion, and you start to get all these additional terms. Additional terms which are always there, but which are either too difficult to measure or you don't see until you get a very strong intensity of light. Okay. And of course, it starts to expand away and away and away. And you get these factors. We've got this beta factor here, gamma factor, and of course, there's more that go out the back. That's what the nature of the Taylor expansion is. What we're going to be talking about today is a combination of synthesis on one hand, and on the other hand, the effects that you can measure. Okay. That's really the two things, because when you put those two things together, doing more than just synthesis, doing more than just characterization, that's when you really start to do some very cool stuff. Okay? So that's why collaborations are always fun. Now, <laughs> this is where Ryan can take over and I can take a back seat. Essentially, we start to get these tensors. We were talking about some of the math courses and the math for physics course that's currently going on, at which point I said, well, I'm just going to have to give up midstream, but forgive me. We end up getting these, okay, these long rank tensors, matrices that are well outside my field. The only time it really is important is talking about whether something has a center of inversion or not. And you'll see that that becomes important when we talk about what we call quadrupolar systems. We're mostly going to be talking about dipolar systems and to a degree octopolar systems. And you might say, so why is switching quadrupolar? And we'll mention what that is in just a bit. And part of the reason is it comes back to the math and all these matrices and how they have an impact. Like I said, this is an experimentalist describing theory. So if I end up beating up in a car park out the back, you'll know why. So I will make a note about units. The units when it comes to nonlinear optics are frankly a mess. Okay, but as long as you know it's a mess, then you can start to work on them. Okay, when we start to describe these units, we have these SI, sometimes called MKS, and then these Gaussian or CGS. As long as you are consistent, don't know why that suddenly did that. As long as you're consistent, that's really the major thing. Maybe it's my slide advancer. No, I'm not sure what that is. Okay, as long as you're consistent. Man, it's Right. As long as you're consistent, that's the main thing. And in this talk, I'm mostly going to try and be consistent. Okay. When we've got these factors that we're talking about, and I've got them listed here, our E for electric field, our linear polarizability, most people are just familiar with that, talking about refractive index and other things. And then here we have our hyperpolarizability and our second hyperpolarizability, our beta and our gamma. Remember, those are the components of that Taylor expansion. Okay. The main thing to take away is sometimes you can have beta, sometimes you can have gamma, depending on whether something's got a center of inversion. Let's work. Let's 
Hey, big that. Okay. So I won't dwell on that too long. Okay. I will point out something important. Okay. When it comes to nonlinear objects, it's important to keep in mind, are we talking about what we call a bulk phase, like a crystal of some material, lithium niobate being a really good example, the very tight max, a whole field of things, or are you talking about a specific molecule itself? So that's the difference between a bulk phase, so we have here bulk, which we describe using this chi 2. Okay. That is part of that Taylor expansion. You've got your alpha, you've got your beta, you've got your gamma, but you also have your chi, your chi squared, up to I guess I call it some point to chi 3. Just something to keep in mind. We don't look at bulk materials. In the work that I'll be presenting here, it's all solution phase. So it's like, oh, you've got this complex, it's dissolved up in dichloromethane, and there you go. So that's the big difference here. Something like the lovely lithium niobate is going to be I to two. The stuff we're looking at is going to be theta for the most part. That's for your second order hyperpolarizability. The second, there's some different names. Okay. There is, of course, whoops, the same thing for your third order. That's either your chi three, being part of that tail expansion, or if you're talking about the molecular species, you're going to be talking about this gamma here. Okay. So just something to keep in mind. The only one you're going to see in this book is the molecular components, looking at something that's in solution, a single molecule is doing the job, as opposed to an entire crystal, or something like this. Yeah, just something to be aware of. Okay, how do we do measurements? I'm going to pack this in the front, because I did the measurements, but I was not the person responsible for the machinery, or the laser setup, or everything else. Okay, that is other collaborators. This is what we call hyper Rayleigh scattering measurements. It's how we measure this beta value. Essentially, there's a couple of older techniques. EFISH is electric field induced second harmonic. If you apply a strong enough magnetic <laughs> electromagnetic field, you can induce change in the environment around the material. We actually would use this system that you see here, this HRS system, which allows you to pull the data out, okay, without needing to go to too much detail. Again, that's somebody else's equipment. The one thing that I will point out is that there's a lot of stuff under the hood. A lot of stuff is like, by the way, you need to take into account, is there anything else absorbing in the same part of the spectrum, okay? you will find out that a lot of the material that we look at was at a particular frequency, 1240. But if you've got something that's at 620, okay, that, of course, is after 1240, so you need to be on the lookout for that. Most of the materials you'll see here today really don't absorb strongly in the visible, except perhaps in the blue part of the spectrum, like 400, 450, around there. Okay, just something to be aware of. So this is the technique that we use, this HRS technique, to measure this beta value. And, of course, there's also a beta zero, which attempts to try and basically, hey, might there be other things that are contributing? You're never sure. Okay, what about gamma? Gamma is a slightly different technique. It's not one I don't think we have access to here at NAU, but you will get laser people you know, they live in basements, they have stable tables, they have a lot of equipment, they okay? bring them samples, they give you results, lovely. Okay? In this case here, we have what we call this Z-scan technique. Okay? The Z-scan is cool because you basically take your sample and you pass it through the focal point of a laser. Okay? It's usually sometimes a two-pumped uh, laser that we, you now the laser point is giving out, that's back here. It's an easier technique than those that preceded them, uh, which are things like this DFW, the generative four way mixing. Okay. But again, you can do this on a lot of samples. You can pull out a lot of data, and that's going to inform you what happens when you make these changes. This is what it looks like. Here we have displacement across this axis, and we've got this self focusing behavior, okay, where you get this apparent change in this curve that you can represent here, and then you can extract all these other material data points from. So, so I'm not going to go into that in too much detail, except to say, hey, this is how we can extract our data. Okay. Let's talk about some of the complexes. It looks like it's screwed up a little bit of formatting, but that's life. Okay. 
These are not my complexes. What I want to show you here is a design philosophy. If we are subjecting something to intense electromagnetic radiation, the idea is that we take electrons from, say, over on this side of the room, and by exciting them, we move them temporarily all the way over there. Okay? That's the idea. Then when the field comes back to zero, it comes back to whatever normal state it is, the electrons move back again. So here we have an electron source, this ruthenium complex here. And over here, we have an electron drain, if you want to think of it. We have a donor on one side that has electrons, and we have an acceptor on the other side. This is the simplest design philosophy you can have. Something that has electrons and something that wants electrons. But you need one other thing. You need a way for electrons to get from point A to point B. And ideally, it's going to be something that's a good road or a good mechanism for getting electrons to travel around. Often that is some high conjugated system here, possibly a double bond, possibly a triple bond. And so what we have here is this molecule is this molecule. Here we have this double bond, CH, double bond, CH, and that's a pretty good road for electrons to travel as they go from where there's a lot of electron density on a metal to somewhere where there's not a lot of electron density, somewhere further up. And that's really what a lot of this uh, electronics and optics all together is it's moving electrons from A to B. And so that's what we can do. Here the solvent's nitromethane. You can see that they are absorbing into the middle part. That's not ideal. And so you always want to know, hey, do these have absorption? Maybe perhaps that's something that could complicate your results. And now we have our beta values. Now, in this case here, what we can take away from this is we see that there's an increase in this beta experimental value. That beta zero is where you're taking into account the fact that you've got some absorption in the visible part of the spectrum. You could end up with two photon absorption. So this is trying to account for that. But even accounting for that, there's a big increase as we go from something that's directly attached to something that's a little bit further away, that has this double bond in between. This is the only difference between these that has got this E alkene bridge. Okay, that's this one here. And we get a nice bump up. If we look at something as simple as ferrocene, okay, with a bridge, and here it's got a two length bridge. We're making the bridge just a little bit longer so the electrons can travel further so they can be polarized further away. Again, we see that there's a small increase. And then as we change the terminal group. So all this down here is what happens when you put a group that really wants to pull electrons, that really wants to drag electrons, something like a nitro. Nitro is good. It's got those electronegative oxygens. Lurine, same trick. Okay. Dicyanose, all sorts of things. The overall effect is yeah, there's a little bit of an increase. Okay, it's not bad. Again, we're using this electrostatic unit value here, but that would be consistent throughout the core. Okay. So there's something to having a bridge in there so that electrons can move about, so that electrons can travel from point A, to where they exist, to point B, and can polarize the whole molecule. Okay. Here's how we can approach this. We can take a dipolar approach. Very simple. The electrons are over here and they want to get over there. Okay. But we can take a quadrupolar approach, which we can represent in a number of different ways. The issue coming back to that theory where you have this tensor is that anything that has a center of inversion, as this molecule does, center of inversion right here, and this molecule should have zero beta, that is zero second order whole polarizability. Now, those are always the case. You get molecular distortions and other things, but do be aware of that. You might be like, hey, you did dipolar, you did octopolar, such as this one down here. Why didn't you consider this one? Now, the other thing that we just saw on the previous slide showing that it had a significant impact was talking about what happens if you make the feature longer as you make it bigger. 
the theory is that as you increase the number of linkages, okay, that calculated beta value should go up. And that's what the preliminary work at the time pretty much indicated. Okay. That as you increase, let's look at this ferrocene one here to a two alkene bridge to a three alkene bridge, we start to see increases in that beta value. Okay. Bigger is better. They will be more polarization of this molecule under our materials. And of course, changing that terminal group. The group wants to pull electrons away from the electron source from the metal center. This is why these metal complexes, what we call organometallic complexes, are so useful because they have a rich source of electrons. So that's the theory at least okay, in terms of calculated B values. So let's start to have a deep look into this. Now, I want to keep you uh, appraised of a few things you're going to see again and again in this talk. You're going to see a lot of ruthenium. Okay? Ruthenium is a pretty handy metal. It does all sorts of good stuff. And you're going to see these bridging bidentate phosphine units. These have a variety of names, but the simplest ones are DPPM, where you've got one bridging carbon, a methylene bridge, or where you've got two bridging carbons, an ethylene bridge, and we don't have any three bridging propane bridge complexes. But you're going to see quite a few of these bidentate phosphines, usually abbreviated as DPPM and DPP. You'll see a few gold complexes, but they're not particularly interesting. They don't have particularly good responses when it comes to their phenomenal optical values. Okay? Um, then we have some vanilladines where there's a double bond to the ruthenium and more commonly the acetylenes. Why ruthenium? It's a good metal. It does lots of good stuff. It has lots of electron density and it skips over a lot of the issues that you could have with other metals, which can be high spin or low spin, pops to 350 or 450 for any of those students here, okay, where they're always going to be all paired up. This is a D6 configuration. For being two, you lost your S electrons, so it's a low spin for D6. Okay, the electrons aren't good in any kind of fun business with the leads. Okay. The groups that you're going to see, again, these are the acceptor, they want to draw up electron density, are going to be groups like this. Okay. Nitro. Okay. Remember, electronegative pulling electrons towards it, or having a propensity, wanting to, or fluorine derivatives. Again, in the four position, okay, that is preferable to the three position, okay, which is what we call out of the plane conjugation. You can't draw a nice simulated quinone. Cyano works well too. Okay. Nitro, not as much. These have some side products, unfortunately. You'd think this is you know, the best thing ever, except that this position here tends to want to fall off because it's too good for its own job. Okay, so just to let you know what you're going to be looking at in terms of complexes here. Okay, synthesis. All right, anyone happen to know, probably, maybe I'll test the audience. 0 0.9 times 0 0.9 times 0 0.9. 0 0.9 times 0 0.9 is easy, it's like 0.81, right? Okay, 0.9 times 0.9 times 0.9. Yeah, that's okay. It's actually about 73. I bring that up because a lot of this is synthesis. And although we would love the synthesis to work in a 100% yield every single time and the computer sort of vomit out the material, okay, sadly that's not the case. So when you have a reaction that works at 70% yield, that's great. And then you have to do a second step at 70% yield and a third step at 70 and you get the idea, okay? You start to run into other challenges especially when you're making these very long systems. Again, we have our electron acceptor group. It wants to pull electrons, and it's got this highway for electrons to travel between. This one would be rather boring, okay, by itself, but now we can put a metal down on this acetylene. And this is an acetylene group with a triple bond, and we can turn that into a metal acetylene by putting a metal on this group right here. This group is rather dull. It's got no electrons to give. We do characterize some of the organics, but honestly, they're not particularly interesting because there's no electrons to contribute. Okay. Of course, we now couple that to our metal center. 
Okay, you stick it on here. It's a pretty straightforward reaction. We take our ruthenium complex, that's this one here. We have our metal uh, here, sorry, laser pointer. We've got our metal here, We've got our um, acetylene here. We couple it with this intermediate, or couple it and turn it into this intermediate vanilladine. Again, the major difference is the double bond, but it's also not linear. Electrons like to travel in straight lines as long as you give them a chance to. And they tend to want to take corners, but hey, you never know. So we have these systems that we see here. This is your metal acetylene. <coughs> metaline, you found metal, metal acetylene. So that's our basic design strategy. Let's look at some X-ray diffraction pictures. Yay, X-ray diffraction. Okay. This is a pretty simple complex. We see the phosphines label up here. Here's the ruthenium. It's a pseudo octahedral around the ruthenium core. Here's that triple bond. Note that the carbon one and carbon two this is very short. Triple bond, of course, very strong, forming them close together. Then we've got our uh, benzene ring here. And this is actually an aldehyde group, CHO, on this terminal in here. It's not the only one you can make, of course, from a variety of them. This one's longer. If it's longer, it surely must be better. Okay. In this case here, we've got a triple bond, an aromatic ring, and another triple bond. We lengthen this system, allowing, in theory, electrons to travel further to be more polarized from one end of the molecule to the other. It's not the only one we can do, of course. We can put a double bond in here. Are double bonds better than triple bonds? Maybe, maybe not. A lot of it depends on how well orbitals can overlap with each other. That's really the key takeaway. Polyenes better than polyines? It depends. This one has the nitro terminal group. Again, here's our electron source. Here's our electron withdrawing group. How easily, how well can we polarize these? Okay, we'll look at the gold systems first. The gold system here, you've got your gold, you've got a triphenylphosphine group out here. These are very easy to make. They're a good starter system. And at the end, we've got this weird group here. And this weird group is really just an aldehyde that's been protected in this particular case. Part of the reason for doing that is so that you can do further chemistry on the aldehyde if you're interested. Okay. And we'll see later on that it is possible to do some chemistry out there. Okay. So this is our system. It's approximately linear. This is in the crystal structure, so it's not perfectly linear. So again, reality meets the road in terms of like, hey, it'd be lovely if it was perfectly straight, but that's not the case. All right, <laughs> let's look at some data. We've got our beta values. Again, the key thing to take away, bigger, better. Okay? This, of course, is trying to take into account other things. Here's our absorption. These really don't absorb anywhere except in the UV. All right. Values, eh, could be worse. Hey, let's put some metals on there. And the values go up. So does the absorption. It tends to come out towards the visible. Remember, 400 is the color between that violet light and the ultra light. And 400 nice round number. Hey, this is looking pretty good. Okay, we've got these systems here. This is a protected aldehyde. This is a deprotected aldehyde. And it turns out that the deprotected aldehyde, just regular CHO, is much better, even when you take into account the uh, fact that you've got to you know, uh, take out some of the two photon absorption. What else do we have? Well, we've got the vanilladine, that's got this double bond to the ruthenium versus the metal acetylide. Uh, much of a muchness, not a significant difference between them. Okay. okay. So what we're getting here is we're starting to get some design parameters, design characteristics, essentially. Okay. All right. Sweet. Well, let's advance. These groups down here have DPPE. Again, this is the vanilladine, this is the acetylide. Yeah, better. Okay, we're improving here. Okay. What else can we get? Gold. Good. Okay. Yeah, not particularly great, but you'll see the data on here. I won't talk too much about the gold situation. What if we take the aldehyde from that four position and put it in the three position? Okay. We can compare this one here. Again, we've got the vanilladine and we've got the acetylide versus these two, 108, 106. Put the aldehyde in the three position. Look, okay. pretty bad. 
Again, those electrons want to travel along the path of conjugation, getting them from point A to point B. They want to make the path easy for them. It's the same melt center, it's the same group that wants to draw electrons to it, but where you put them is so important. How you design your molecule. Okay. Uh, we had them in the two position, slightly better, but really not enough to justify anything. Okay. What about if you just compare something boring? This is the nitro. Again, it's in the fourth position. Here's the extended one. Here's our beta results. And then we have these phenyl acetylene, phenyl vinyl. Okay. These are pretty terrible. Even without them, they're really still better. Okay. Once we start to put them on, so let's consider here where we've got the nitro. Now we're talking. And even when you take into account the fact that these are absorbing out into that green part of the spectrum, for now, and the violet indigo part of the spectrum, it's still a significant improvement. Okay? And then, of course, this one is trying to compensate for two photo absorption. So we start to have an idea. Put something that's going to draw the electrons, give it a chance to absorb. Okay. Let's extend the system. Does that work? Well, let's compare this one here and this one here, 10 and 12. It's slightly better, and we're not getting a significant change in the absorption peak in the visible, but we are getting an increase here okay, between our values. And okay, so it's a way that we can start to see, hey, if you make it longer, you're not doing too much different. You try getting better responses. So let's make it even longer again. Okay, let's not put just one uh, nitro group in here. Sorry, correction, one acetylene. We make it longer. And now we make it even longer again. Okay, yeah, looking pretty promising. The longer you make it, the more electrons can be taken from the source to where they want to be. We start to have these design properties. What about fertile? That's that gamma value. Now that gamma value, of course, doesn't have the same problem that beta has. Okay. Here it is here. Now, it is a complex uh, system. Here's the absolute. Here's the real and imaginary. I'll go into that in any significant detail whatsoever, except to be aware of it. Again, let's just look overall. No substituent, pretty weak. A okay. little bit longer with the nitro on the end. Yeah, about the same, maybe better. Okay. Make it longer again. Start to see further and further improvements. Okay. And again, this is without any sort of metal here to provide electrons to be pushed and pulled around. All right. What happens when you start to put metals on there? Okay. Remember, all of these don't have that nitro group. When you've got the source, electrons, you've got something tugging at them, the nitro or the fluoro, and then in the middle, you've got the bridge. Okay. Let's just go all the way to the end here. Is where we've got the three things. We've got the source, we've got that acetylene group, and we've got the nitro, and we really start to see improvements. And as you go down further, further improvements again. So the key thing is we've got a design philosophy. Okay? Source, bridge, etc. That's the three things that seem to be working well in this dipolar system. Okay? All right, but if you've been on the time, it's time to speed up. We've got some other ones that are more interesting, perhaps, but I won't go into them in significant detail because I don't want to bore people. Again, we've got a method, how we make these. We take them here, here's our acetylene, couple them to our methenium center. We start to compare, well, oh, hey, nitros work really well. Okay, we see a significant increase once you change that term. So that kind of agrees with what we saw earlier. Okay. Anything else? Well, here we've got gold. We have results, but they're not great. Once you start to get away from gold and go to ruthenium, now you're talking. Okay? Now, in this case here, we've got multiple sources of electrons, and we can push and pull. Okay? In this case here, we've got two ruthenium centers. This is a Z-scan result. Remember, this gamma value is not dependent on whether you've got a center of conversion or not, that's really the beta result. And we go through and be like, hey, yeah, we can produce really big values of gamma here yeah. using that design philosophy. So I'm not going to go into this one in any significant detail. It's 335, so I want to keep time. You can include something like ferrocene in here. 
Okay, ferrocene, very common complex. Most importantly, it has a very convenient switch. It is plus two normally okay, in the iron state. But if you change the plus three, you can block the flow of electrons. It's a way to turn on the flow or turn off the flow. That's really what this was interested in this particular section, that the ferrocene could act as a way to block electrons from traveling across this pi conjugated system you can see here. Again, there's a lot of background chemistry in here, but I won't subject you to it. What do we see? Here's our ferrocene at the center. So this is this series of complexes here, 12 through 14. Eh, they're, they're all right, they're nothing special. Put some gold on there. Remember, this is a digold center. Eh, eh, you know, not an amazing sort of thing, but you can do it. Okay. Ah, now we're talking. Okay, now we're talking down here. Again, we've got the same bridging system. Just has that there is another source of electrons in the middle. And now, yeah, those aren't rookie numbers anymore at all. Now we're talking. So that's what's going on here. We've got these design velocities that we can exploit. All right. The systems that I am going to strike here in the next bit, again, I've got more slides than I'll get to, but that's okay. Save more for later. It's talking about what called dendrites. Dendros, uh, dendrochronology, dendrochronology, what the hell is that? Yeah, let's see how old stuff is by cutting down trees. Now, well, that tree was 10,000 years old until yesterday. It's, in this case here, the dendrima term means tree like or branchy. Okay? And these dendrimas can have all sorts of interesting properties. Gabe, of course, does amazing stuff with electron transfer. Okay, so it does really cool stuff with that. And making energy flow from point A to point B in between. Now, they can be problematic. Okay. Especially if there's lots of synthesis. That's the 0 0.9, 0 0.9, 0 0.9 problem, right? You know, at the end, you get 1% yield and you're proud of it. In this case here, okay, we can do sneaky stuff, okay, sneaky synthesis stuff, all right? So let's talk about what we can do. Note that this is a different design philosophy. Before we were talking perfectly dipolar electrons here, what do we get here? Now we're going to octopolar. No, we we'll skip over the quadrupolar space here. Okay. So we can do this design philosophy, introducing these alkene groups here, and then doing more reactions to get our terminal acetylene so that we can start to put metals on there. Because we saw that each part serves an important the bridge map, the metal map, dog, ooh, yay, nitro, yay, aldehyde, eh. yeah, you get the idea. And then once you go through enough of these, you start to be like, teasing out these design philosophies. So this is an older synthesis. This is not mine, okay? But you see you're suffering from the same problem again. I'm sure someone could run these numbers and determine based on the yield of each step what the final yield of this material is. I bet the answer is not good, okay? Not great at all, okay? Let's say 20% at best. Then there's these alternative strategies. Again, multiple steps to get to your final species. Okay. But this is where we can be sneaky. Okay. Sneaky in the sense of if you try to react three or more equivalents of these ruthenium complexes with this triethanol benzene, it doesn't work. It doesn't work fully. Instead, what you get is you get substitution on two of the sites. Okay. Two of the sites, but not the third. What is missing here, what's a little bit deceptive to the eye, is just how bulky these groups are. We saw some of those crystal structures. These groups are really large. They take up a lot of space. And the problem is, is that you're unable to put a third group on there. There's simply so much space taken up around here and here that this group is not available. This is where the time that becomes sneaky, of course. Because what you can do, okay, here's our crystal structure, notice how bulky these groups are, and it's just not possible to get a third group in here. But what you can do, okay, don't worry about this, I'll skip right over it, okay, is do something like this, couple them together. In this case, it can't react with another ruthenium complex, 
but it can react with an equivalent of itself to do what's called this a couple product. Okay. Again, it's got things that we need. It's got metal centers. It's got pathways for electrons to move them about. Okay. Now we can start to put stuff on. Okay. Here it is again. Here's that vacant acetylene down the bottom here. Okay. We can cap these groups. That's important so you don't get side reactions. So we stick this phenyl. And if we wanted to be fussy, we could make this a nitrophenyl to really bump those numbers up, the electron withdrawing groups. Okay, what can we do? 72%, meh, it's not bad. We can extend this linker here, make it longer again. Okay, 82%, yeah, pretty good reaction. Yeah, anything above 70 is pretty good. Okay, deprotected, We're taking this TMS group off here, make it into a H. And now we can couple it okay, to get a system like this here. This is this dendrome. You see, this has got this tree like structure. Electrons can come and talk to each other or flow down into the system. And of course, you could put more tree like materials. But I hear you say, well, that's a lot of steps. And I agree, it's a lot of steps. But we've got this complex. Yeah, maybe we could do something else with it. We can start to look at can these talk to each other? I won't go into this in too much detail since we're getting short on time. Okay. But we can do stuff. These are actually able to talk to each other. This is this electrochemistry trace where when this changes oxidation state from two plus to three, it talks to this one. Talks to this in the sense of it's more difficult to remove that second electron because this one is like, oh, you've stopped my electron. So it grabs on more tightly causing this other one to also hold on to its electrons. And we can see that quite clearly in the electrochemical trace. What's interesting is although these two are talking to each other and these two are talking to each other, you actually don't get any communication along with this axis, which is not that much longer. Okay? But it's interesting. Okay? Tells you it's like, okay, what's the extent that electrons can talk to each other? Okay, I'm going to start to move here. There's not too much time. I want to keep you lovely people a chance to get out of here. This is just talking about how strongly this is this K-com, this proportionality constant, uh, talking about how well the electrons are talking to each other. All right. Um, again, all organic, no metals in here. Values, pretty meh. Okay, nothing special to write home about. Put some gold on there, although we already know what gold is. Okay. Stick some ruthenium on there. Now we're increasing those numbers. Of course, we saw that before, so it's no surprise that we're confirming that again with this one here. Okay. As we start to go into the full size dendrimus, okay, biggest of the tree like structures, okay, we really start to see improvements, significant improvements in these gamma absolute values here. Okay. And again, yeah, not too bad. Large error values, but that's pretty normal with these systems. Okay, so don't be too worried about you know oops, about those errors that we see. Yeah. Okay. Sweet. Thank you. Until now. A couple of minutes. Two or three minutes later. All right. I'm not going to talk about the multi-metallic center. They told you I would speed run those, except that you can do essentially the same sort of approach. Okay, where they can start to be coupled to each other and using the same sneaky design philosophy again. This site is unable to be occupied. There's just too much stuff around. Okay. Um, I think I am going to skip all of this in terms of what we can refer to. We can introduce some more switches, way to turn things on and off. Um, skip all of that. And now uh, these are more quadrupolar approaches. Again, they have their advantages, but their disadvantages. But let me just sum up here real quick. Here it is. Now. So, what's this work being all about? Okay. This should be kind of just questions. Okay. We can couple synthesis to characterization. That's probably the main thing to take away. Never be a specialist in one or find out a really good collaborator who can help you out with it. That's the really important lesson from this. You can do synthesis, find someone who can do characterization. You do characterization, find someone who can do synthesis. Okay. What else have we got? And okay. these transition metals or clusters, if you're a cluster person, I see a few of our lovely cluster people in the audience here, they're great sources of electron density. They do fantastic things. Okay. 
We've got all these NLO relevant materials that allow us to make decisions on how to design these materials. Okay. And although they are not perhaps as strong as our standard things like lithium niobate, okay, they allow us to test out design strategies. We've only got our hundred or so elements in the periodic table, but we have a lot of variability we can do on the molecular scale. Right. So sorry for the rush through on the end of that. I appreciate your time and I'll happily entertain any questions at the uh, request of our lovely introducer. Thank you so much. So that's some audience questions. And if you saw a particular slide you want me to go to, I'll absolutely do that as well. Sorry. Yeah, I will just, yeah. So how fast is the result useful to use hands to Yeah, pretty quick, like same day essentially. Or you mean how quick is the response in the molecule? Uh, yes. So I'm just wondering if you can use the different to me and get the same result. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good question. Yeah, a lot of the time you've got some options. So, for example, if we look at the gamma technique, okay, all molecules display a gamma type response. You can use either the Z scan, which is pretty popular. A lot of uh, even you know regular size and new size universities may have that depending on the laser spectroscopist. You have older techniques like degenerative four wave mixing. So, if someone can't do that, maybe they can do something else. In terms of the molecular response, you're usually looking on the femtosecond time scale. These are pretty quick responses. You know, again, electrons are being moved over here. And of course, what do they want to do? They want to come back again. So, yeah, we're looking femtosecond. Yeah. You can look further down, you can go to picosecond if you're interested. Um, but most of the time, it's like, yeah, femtosecond will do. Nanosecond, not quite long enough, I don't think. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're working a lot on increasing these non-wing areas. I was just wondering what you were interested in like doing with higher numbers. Yeah, yeah, no, that's an excellent question. Unfortunately, if I stuck with even one more slide, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, a lot of it just has to do on how we can start to tweak responses. It's kind of strange how we've come full circle. I don't know whether I can find the exact slide, but let me do my best. Uh, oh, almost. Here we go here. So let him know that's a great one. You know, there's all these materials which we want to have particularly interesting responses. So let him know they is great for turning electrical signals into optical signals. Photons go in, the current comes out, or vice versa, as the case might be. Now, lithium niobate is great, but if you look at your uh, niobium column, column number five, you've got tantalum. I don't think too much dubnium exists in the universe, but that's okay. Okay, This gives us a chance. I guess I should, have been, should not have exaggerated that bigger numbers are better, but it tells you it's just like, hey, we're heading in the right direction. Now, in terms of application, there's a lot of stuff, especially with, say, quantum, where you're talking about photons communicating, being entangled. And that's certainly where I've been working a lot, may not working, but interacting with lithium novate, things like waveguides and other stuff. Yeah, sorry, that was a very long answer. Sorry about that. No questions. For a crystal, no? That's a crystal. That is correct. Yes. Yeah. No, it's and it's a good material. It's optically very transparent, uh, has good piezoelectric responses. Um, but of course, it's hard to tweak it. You can dope it, certainly. Um, but you know, it has has its own issues. How is Mr. Brothers? It's very difficult to grow those crystals. Um, I don't think lithium nitrate's too bad. I think you can grow them fairly easily. I know we're about to start to look at spin coating thin films. Doing it to get perfect crystallinity, that's a little more challenging, I think. Yeah. I have to say, why gold goes to gold? What is wrong with gold? What is, sorry? Wrong with gold. Um, I think, it, well, I was always told it was how it holds on to its electron density, which to me sounds like an answer that doesn't make a lot of sense because gold, of course, is in the 5D metal set. Mm -hmm. So I'm not exactly sure. Perhaps it was because it's a closed shell D10, because this is gold one. So these usually end up being closed shell D10 configurations. So I think that might be the issue there. But in terms of the physical size and the ability to polarize, you would almost expect gold to be easier. Yeah, so I have a feeling it's that closed shell B10 configuration. 
Um, so you mentioned you, you want to be able to characterize control of uh, of increasing your um, your beta values. Hmm. I was wondering, so you said you can increase the chain length and it would increase your beta value. Mm -hmm. Do you have an expression that kind of shows like how much you increase? Yeah, yeah. Um, there are some simple expressions. Um, as with plans, they rarely survive contact with the real world. Like it's like, oh, you can have like um, epsilon with some power, like here's 0.5. As you increase the length, the recognition is, oh, it's not as good. Oh, so correction, it gets better, but it doesn't get four times better. Maybe it gets twice as better, and then it starts to drop off. A lot of it comes down to the fact and the reason why we use polyines is because the tendency for like benzene rings to twist away from each other where the orbitals don't overlap as much as you would expect in a nice line drawing. And you may have seen some of that in the crystal structures where the chemical structure has drawn is beautiful and simple and perfect and has perfect overlap. And then in the crystal structure in solution, they're like moving around or twisting. So, so that you can use a simple value to sort of measure that. Uh, but then, of course, actually doing measurements is even better. So you find like a limitation. So you can't just like infinitely expand it and get it. And, you know, it's, it's true, it's true. Like, yeah, that is that is the case. You know, electrons, they will move, give them enough of a push. But of course, they also want to come back and that takes a finite amount of time. Oh, um, you mentioned the reaction time, quick reaction time, but you know, and the post after the solution. Is that why, would, would it be necessary to have femtosecond pulse lasers in order to get to photon absorption, or do you think you have without the femtosecond pulse? To measure the two photon absorption, it would be better. You could probably do some measurements with nanosecond time lasers, but I think you would be better off with that additional, you know, nanosecond on an electron some photon interaction is not that long, even though it is like, a nanosecond. How much? How far does light travel in a nanosecond? Like a foot? Isn't that it? You know, that's the famous thing from uh, Admiral Hopper. Anyway, uh, long story short, you would be, be the better off you are, the better off when you've got a better laser. Essentially, you can measure where those electrons are going, and you can also measure more of those constants. We easy find it easy to measure beta and gamma, but there are other you know additional higher order ones out there. You know, which you can also measure with a better system. They are also weaker, so if you're dancing. Yeah. So how, like, one of the big advantages of using these molecular systems is that they're highly definable and um, tweak. Yes. So how can we incorporate them into, like, global materials for waveguides and stuff for the networks um, for applications? I have a coming idea. Maybe even a coming plan, okay? Uh, MOPS or polymeric systems would absolutely be a totally perfect avenue. I think MOPS would be ideal. Polymerics, of course, they're, they're squiggly, essentially. But MOPS would be a good one where you have everything in a very consistent area where it's just like, hey, we know that when you have two, let's say a four carbon chain, that's a sweet spot. No, perfect, you know, in terms of like just the right length. Okay. So you could design that into a MOF, metal organic framework, probably it's easy uh, jargon. Okay, where you design that in, and now you've got the benefits of a molecular system that tweaked and tuned to perfection, but you also have the advantage of a bulk system giving you that, um, you know, beta, sorry, chi two and chi three plant values. So yeah, maybe you can even put something in the holes. Okay, we have time for one more two questions. What's the all time world record for our molecule? Molecular high I don't know. I wonder what it might be. These are these at the time, this is going back a few years now, were pretty good, okay, in terms of linear systems. Basically, if you throw more electrons at one end, like by putting a cluster on there, perhaps, okay, you can definitely start to push things, of course. You know, um, the downside is it's all a trail. Always a trail. If you start to come into the visible spectrum because it's absorbing, instead of getting the absorption you want, you start to get two photon absorption instead. Okay. And that's where it's difficult to say this one is better than this one, especially with those error bars, but we'll ignore that for right now, where it's just like, well, this got a very strong response. 
but it also absorbs very strongly in the region of interest. The region of interest is typically our 1240 kind of regime, anything that's telecommunication wavelength. So if it absorbs strongly in there, it's just like, ooh, even though it might have a fantastic response at the same time. So, yeah, so these ones were definitely looking pretty good with advancing multi-generational dendronism, cluster-based complexes and other things like that. What about the fullerenes? Oh, oh, so much electron density on a fullerene. Oh, that'd be, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, that's why they're so good as these like transport layers where you've got like C60 hooked up to like a porphyrin or something like that, where the porphyrin is providing a lot of electron density, the fullerene is able to accept or donate. Yeah, porphyrin and fullerene is great systems for that. But, uh, bucky tubes as well. Yeah, you know, lots of electron density. Easy pathways for electrons to travel. Excellent. You were not in San Diego. You were on the way out during all. All right. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you. That was good.